today, for our Experts in Emotion interview, we have the pleasure of speaking with Dr. Maya Tamir on the dark side of positive emotion. Dr. Tamir is an assistant professor and the director of the Emotion and Self-Regulation Laboratory at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She completed her undergraduate degree at Tel Aviv University, received her PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and completed her postdoctoral training at Stanford University. Dr. Tamir is most interested in understanding what motivates people to regulate their emotions, and in her quest, she studies the implications of both pleasant and unpleasant emotional experiences and people's beliefs, thoughts, and feelings about emotions. So I'll now turn to a very special emotion and expert interview with my colleague, Dr. Maya Tamir, on the dark side of positive emotion. So welcome, Maya. Thanks for speaking with us today. Thanks for having me. That's very nice of you. Oh, well, you're the nice one here. <laughs> so I just wanted to start by asking you a little bit about your journey into the world of emotion, sort of what first got you started or excited to think about getting into this topic in the first place? Life. <laughs> I mean, you know, life is imbued with emotions. Um, emotions are probably the most wonderful thing in life. They can be the most terrible thing in life. I think we're all students of emotion uh, in many, many ways. Mm. And um, I guess I just decided to study emotions um, as a scientist as well. It was only natural for me. That's wonderful. And you're right. Life is imbued with emotions. So how could it not attract your attention to want to understand it, right? I mean, I really think we're all, we all study emotions all the time, right? It's just that some of us do it in a laboratory and some of us don't. That's a really good point. I love it. So since you've decided to embark into studying emotions in the laboratory, you've done a lot of really amazing work. And I want to ask you just a little bit about it today. Um, so one of the things I wanted to ask you about is your work that has, um, you know, scientifically demonstrated that positive emotions, contrary to what most of us might think, are not always adaptive and can actually be disadvantageous in specific circumstances, such as your work suggests maybe engaging in competitive tasks. And so I wonder if you could say a little bit about how positive emotions seem to be less adaptive in this kind of context. Well, according to some theories, um, specific emotions have evolved to help us cope with specific types of challenges. Right? And so um, if you think about the types of challenges that we've confronted in our evolutionary past, um, one of them was to avoid threats. And so you could argue that maybe fear has evolved as a way to help us avoid threats. And another type of challenge was to fight with enemies over resources. And so anger has evolved to help us effectively fight enemies. And another type of challenge is actually to form um, collaborations with people who wanna, who wanna work with us. And so one of the things that happiness may do is help us get close to others and work with others. So um, if you think about emotions very broadly in that sense, um, emotions can be good in some contexts and not very good in others. Um, and it's funny because when we talk about emotions, we use these terms. Uh, we use the terms positive emotion, we use the term negative emotions. And what's implied by that is that some emotions are good and some emotions are bad. But that's not necessarily true. Um, it's not necessarily true for any emotion and it's not necessarily true for positive emotion. Um, we've learned in, in my lab and in many other labs that study um, cooperation and competition that when you need to collaborate with somebody else, being happy is actually very useful because it helps you connect with others and trust others. But when you need to fight, being happy is actually not particularly adaptive because it makes you trust people that you shouldn't trust. So in some contexts, happiness can be very useful, in others, not so much. Interesting. So if you think of, it sounds like the take home lesson of what we can learn about positive emotion is that it really depends on the context as to whether or not it can be useful for us or less useful. Is that right? Right. Excellent. Um, and I mean, on this vein, I know you and I have worked on a paper with one of our lovely colleagues, um, Dr. Iris Mouse, 
really trying to delineate the different ways that positive emotion can be disadvantageous, which people have coined the dark side of happiness. And I wonder, you know, from this work that we've done together, what you think of as, you know, the guiding principles that dictate, you know, both when and how positive emotion might not always be to our best advantage. Well, the key for me when I think about um, about emotions and adaptation is that really we fool ourselves into thinking that some emotions are necessarily positive or good and some emotions are necessarily negative or, or bad. And so when you think about positive emotions, um, they, they are often very good, um, but they can also be bad at times, right? They can have a, a dark side. Um, for example, we know that some positive emotions are um, better than others. Um, for example, hubristic pride is a wonderful example. When you think that you're the best person around, well, that could feel wonderful, uh, but it can have negative consequences for your social relationships. Um, there could be emotions that are um, uh, pleasant, but um, they're not um, desirable according to your culture. For example, we know that pride um, in um, cultures such as the U.S. are wonderful to feel, but in cultures such as China, uh, they're not uh, as desirable. And so there might be types of positive emotions that are better than others. Uh, but even if we put aside all those positive emotions that we think are not as good, um, even the best positive emotion could be wonderful in some contexts and not in others, like um, um, what we talked about before. Even if you feel love uh, or joy, uh, in a way it might be detrimental if you experience in a context that calls for a very different type of emotion. Right? As we mentioned before, we talked about collaboration. We said that if you're, if you're entering a field of enemies, um, maybe being cheerful is not the best thing at that moment. Uh, maybe you need to be uh, a little cautious, a little frightened maybe. Right? Maybe you need to be angry in order to, to fight for your rights in that context. Um, so. You want to experience the right type of, of positive emotion. You want to feel the right type of positive emotion in the right context. And like anything else in life, you want to experience positive emotion in moderation. Um, if you experience positive emotion to an extreme, um, that can that can be very um, that can be very harmful. Um, we know that um, there's lovely work on um, uh, intensity and frequency of positive emotions, showing that. If you um, experience very intense, um, very frequent positive emotions, you may be actually a little bit less satisfied with your life uh, than if you experience just a little bit less <laughs> of frequent positive emotions. If you experience very, very intense positive emotions, uh, it may have some um, negative consequences. For example, it may um, make you very uh, rigid. It may make you focus on yourself and ignore others. It may uh, make you prone to take risks, uh, even unnecessary risks. And you do, you've done lovely work linking um, intense positive emotions to um, psychopathology, showing, for example, that um, intense positive affect is, is characteristic of manic individuals. And so everything in moderation, I think, I think, I think that's the right thing to do. So if, so if you ask me you know, what my recommendation would be for people who try to pursue happiness or positive emotions, the right type of positive emotions in the right context and in the right amount. Beautiful. And it sounds like at the end of the day, we all come back to Aristotle's, you know, ancient wisdom about all these three principles. So thank you so much, Maya. Um, what I wanted to ask you about was just, I mean, you have so many different lines of exciting work, so it's hard to pinpoint what are the questions just to speak with you about today, but one of the things that I wanted to make sure to ask, what? You're very nice to me, Jane, thanks. Well, you're very nice, but not too nice and not mm -hmm. too friendly. Right, and not always. Not always in every context. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you've done some really interesting work on instrumental emotion regulation, you know, demonstrating that people might not always want to feel good, actually, and that sometimes they may actually want to experience pleasant emotions, whereas other times they may not want to experience pleasant emotions and may actually want to experience unpleasant emotions. So I wondered if you could flesh out this interesting and perhaps counterintuitive finding to many people out there in the audience. 
I like the word the word positive and negative and good and bad because I think they have many different implications. Um, the question that I've been interested in for a while now is what do people want to feel? Because if we think about emotion regulation and we think about times in our lives when we want to change how we feel, I think that immediately we, we think about those times when we try to be less nervous or less angry or happier and we rush to asking, well, what what's the strategy, right? What would be the way for me to, to, to get rid of one emotional state and, and embrace another? Um, but if we want to understand how and why people regulate their emotions, we first need to understand what it is that they want to feel in different contexts. And um, I do think actually that people want to feel good. Um, it's just that I think that there are several different definitions of good. Uh, you know. It, one obvious definition, especially if you think about emotions, involves pleasure. When we think about positive emotions or when we think about feeling good or feeling good emotions, then we typically think about emotions that are pleasant to feel. But if you um, walk on, the, um, on campus at Yale and you grab an innocent student and ask them, define good to me or tell me what's good, I don't know if, if the only answer you'll get is pleasure, right? Because when we think about good, we think about a variety of things. We think about things that are helpful or things that are useful or things that are meaningful, and that's also part of good. And so what, um, when I think about emotion regulation and the, and the emotions that people want to feel, I think people want to feel emotions that are pleasant, but they also want to feel emotions that would bring about that those things that are good for them. They want to feel emotions that are useful. Uh, they want to feel emotions that are helpful. They want to feel emotions that are meaningful. And these different emotions are not necessarily pleasant to feel. Uh, they can be, uh, but not necessarily so. Um, I think that people, people seek happiness, um, but they seek those things that make them happy rather than happiness per se. And we can think about emotions as a toolbox, right? As, 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 as a box of tools that help us attain those goals that are important to us. And we've done some um, research showing that when people have a specific goal, right, when they want to achieve something, um, they want to um, do well on a test or they want to um, um, get the most in a negotiation or they want to do well in a computer game, they can pick different types of emotions that will help up, that will help them optimize or maximize those outcomes that they that they want. Um, and these emotions can be good or pleasant. These emotions can be unpleasant, but they're good in the sense that they're helpful and useful to them. That's so interesting. I mean, it makes me wonder, kind of, what are the implications this research has? Really teasing apart pleasant and unpleasant from good and bad, which is so important, and I feel like is so rarely done in the literature which is why what you do is just so, so crucial here. You know, what implications do you think this has for, you know, the kind of emotional goals people set for themselves and ultimately their well-being at the end of the day? Well, I think one distinction we need to, we need to make is, is to what extent do I only care about how I feel right now? Uh, and that's a very valid and important goal versus to what extent do I care about long-term outcomes? When you care about how you feel right now, what you want to do is you want to change what you feel right now to something that 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 you that you want, right? And typically, we want to feel good in the we want to feel pleasure in the moment. We want to get rid of things that are unpleasant. But as soon as we look at our lives, kind of in a in as, as a longer process, and we we do that all the time, right? We do that by going to school and spending a lot of time studying, you know, late at night, even if we don't like it because we care about those longer term goals, right? We do that when we fight with a partner uh, or go to an opera or to a ball game, even though we don't want to because we care about a relationship that's, that's, that's long term. And I think that um, emotions are very, are very similar to that. If all we think about is just the current moment and all we think about is feeling good right now, we may end up hurting ourselves in the long term. But if we think about life in the longer term and we make sure that we use our emotions in ways that are helpful for our long-term goals, um, then I think we can maximize a long-term happiness. Um, so. That's lovely. So when you think then about where the sort of face of 
uh, emotion in the future, kind of where it's headed, um, based on some of the research you've done and sort of what got you hooked into this field in the first place, where do you see where do you see the next important steps for the future of emotion? <laughs> in your humble opinion. <laughs> um, well, um, you know, I think that the field of emotion as a whole has made some incredible strides in the past 10 years or so. And, um, and I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, in the next 10 years, um, research is going to come out that's going to change the way that we understand what emotions are, um, how they work. Um, what the what the what what mental processes are, um, how things work together, what's the difference between di different mental processes? I mean, I think that you know we, it's very similar to kind of how we how we began our conversation, but mm. by saying that we use words and we think that these words reflect reality, right? We we use the word positive emotion and negative emotion, and that helps us make you know very very um, clear sense of reality. But I think that you know reality is very. Is very complex, and um, and I think that it's particular particularly true about emotion. So I I think we're gonna we're gonna discover some amazing, um, truly kind of groundbreaking, um, shattering discoveries about about what emotions are. Um, I think we're gonna discover some, some amazing things about pleasure. I think we're gonna discover some amazing things about what pleasure, how it, pleasure and emotions work together, um, um, what the role of pleasure is, how it's formed, what it does. So I, 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 I look forward to it. But I may, I may be wrong completely. Uh, I highly doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> but when you think about sort of where the field's headed, I mean, obviously you'll be a part of that and all the current colleagues we have in our field will, but the ones that are going to take this to the next generation will be the students at this moment, you know, or those who are considering maybe pursuing, you know, studies in emotion. So when you meet with your students and they sort of ask you for advice or they're thinking about embarking in the field of emotion, what advice do you usually give them? Uh, well, if you ask me about the advice that I give my own students, I say, stay in the lab, work hard, and do what I tell No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think, I think the best advice I can give people is, um, to be bold, um, to challenge ideas, uh, to challenge basic assumptions, um, not to fear to go against the, the stream, because I think that, you know, that's the way to, to discovery. Um, and to enjoy the process. Because if you don't have fun doing science, then don't do it. So I think that's my, that's my advice. Have fun and be good. I love that. And just remembering to enjoy the process. I think it's something that maybe not enough people really emphasize. And it's lovely that you give that advice to students. Because you're right. Why would we be here in the first place if we didn't enjoy it? And it's wonderful, isn't it? It is. Science, mm -hmm. and especially emotion science, is a really beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, thank you, Maya, for speaking with us today. Thank you, June. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Maya Tamir from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem.